So any any questions from yesterday? <coughs> Near the end, we got a little confused with normalizations. Um, what I wrote down was correct. The way I was describing it was probably not probably confusing. Um, I hope you have all figured it out. Some of you have, um, at least. So uh, yesterday we, um, so from the collisionless Boltzmann equation, um, we tried to um, look at some spherical steady state models because these are extremely important in astrophysical context. Um, and the way we were writing the distribution function, um, which we are allowed to, uh, is in terms of integrals of motion. So negative energy is an integral of, of motion. And we wrote it as a power law. And it's valid when this is positive. And we showed that if you make these assumptions, then the density becomes something of this form. So some constant times uh, potential to the n. And then we did some analogy with hydrostatic systems and uh, made an analogy with this power law index and the gamma. This is the ratio of specificates you know. And uh, the analogy only is, is uh, valid when gamma is less than 3. When gamma greater than 3, then you get infinite densities, and uh, it's no good. So we will try to solve um, a par uh, some particular cases for this kind of polytropic distribution functions. Um, so of course, this is family of distribution function. You can uh, generate many different types of uh, dis uh, densities and uh, potentials. Um, I have chosen a few that are particularly interesting for astrophysical purposes, for star clusters, galaxies, etc. Um, so let's get on with it. Yes. No, so so this condition really means that it is bound. So what you call energy in the normal convention, you call it half v square minus psi, right? That's how you are used to seeing energy. So that being negative means it's a bound system. So just so that I don't have to write negative every time I write f as a function of e. I just defined it the opposite way. So whenever this thing is positive, it means a bound system. So this distribution function essentially means nothing uh, very strange. It just says that distribution function, so everything that we're interested in is bound. Anything, anywhere it's not bound, the distribution function is zero. That's all this means. Okay. Anything else? Chalk. White. Okay, so now we are going to look at something very specific. So we are looking for some unique solutions of particular types of density distributions. So let's say that the density depends only on R, and it's again a power law. So of course, uh, power laws are very um, close to heart for all physicists because uh, they are 
well behaved and you can take any number of derivatives. So they are always smooth. So it's always easy to um, take power laws. And when you have uh, complicated shapes, uh, people do broken power laws or combinations of power laws. Uh, and for anything that is well behaved and has no singularities anywhere, then you know that you can, in principle, uh, take any function and write it in terms of Taylor series. So this is actually very powerful uh, to just think of power laws, because you can take superpositions of different power laws and pretty much describe anything. <coughs> so this makes, so we know that rho is tied to the n, I'm just dropping cn, okay. That means psi is r to the minus alpha n. And then if you solve the Poisson's equation, So that be the Poisson's equation if you assume rho as cn psi to the n, right? And then if you replace these uh, things as uh, the psi n as r to the minus alpha over n, then it turns out that you get something like minus alpha over n times 1 minus alpha over n, r to the minus 2 minus alpha over n, plus 4 pi g c n r to the minus alpha. This needs to be true for any r. So, this and this needs to be equal. So from that, you get alpha equals 2n over n minus 1. So that means that you can take a density distribution that is a power of r, for it to satisfy the Poisson's equation, you need this power, the power law index, to be related to the polytropic index of the density through this equation. Okay? So from this, you get a more stringent con condition on n. How so? So you know that if it's a self-gravitating sphere, then just from the inverse square law, the potential cannot drop fast, uh, cannot drop slower than r to the minus one. Right? So at least there is that mass, so there is the drop in potential. So alpha over n, sorry, um, so alpha over n, uh, this one, must be less than or equal to minus one. And if you combine these two, then you get n must be greater than three, equal to 3. So we already knew that n must be greater than half. 
And for density distributions that are only dependent on the distance, or r, from the center, then you see that n must be actually greater than or equal to 3. Okay. And this is only for spherical systems, where the potential, uh, uh, the density, uh, depends only on the R coordinate. Now, of course, in a density distribution like this, it's very easy to uh, find what's the enclosed mass, etc. Right? So, M at some R is simply. proportional to r to the n minus 3 over n minus 1. So, what you can see here is if n equals 3, so now we're looking at specific cases of this n. So, if n equals 3, then the mass r is a constant. It doesn't depend on r. So if the mass enclosed doesn't depend on r, can you give an example of that system? So mass is finite, and it doesn't depend on R, mass enclosed. So think of this. So let's say this is the center. You can draw circles of any radius, spheres of any radius. The mass enclosed in this sphere is the same as the mass enclosed in this sphere. It's very easy, actually. Yes. A point mass at center and massless things moving around. So this is equivalent to saying a dominant mass at the center and you are only dealing with test particles. So that's n equals 3. n equals 3 is point mass at r equals 0. How about n goes to infinity? Um, does it? So when n is infinity, m of r is proportional to r. So this gives you potentials that look like log r. OK, so let's look at something interesting. So we know that n is infinity. So remember the equivalence of the gas systems with stellar dynamical systems. So if n is infinity, 
gamma is 1. So that means this is equivalent to, right? So gamma is 1. So this is what? Yes, isothermal gas. So in this limit, if you work in this limit, the polytropic stellar dynamics uh, distribution functions are called isothermal spheres. And we will take a look at how an isothermal sphere looks like a little bit later. Okay? And that's because it's equivalent to a gaseous system that is isothermal. Um, what else? Um, what do you think? So the question was, um, the, the potential goes as log r, is it it is a bound system. You were asking whether it's a bound system or not. The answer is it's a bound system in the sense that the energy is, uh, so energetically it's bound. But I think what you meant is, is it a finite system or not? Uh, it is not. So the, the size of the system will be infinite distribution function will never go, zero, go to zero. It's not. So that's why you need to do uh, several interesting things. But before going there, let's look at something disturbing since, uh, okay, I will not tell you what, what is disturbing. Uh, let's see if uh, anyone can tell me what is disturbing in this form. So, what is disturbing here? Yes, so there is a singularity at r equals to zero. So you can do um, tricks that are pretty general in any kind of uh, inverse square law uh, manipulation. So the reason why normally in real cases you never reach a singularity is because some assumption in the whole distribution function mechanism breaks down at some point. So when you have a sufficiently small enclosed volume, the assumptions of large n, et cetera, or something breaks down. Okay. So, <clears throat> But to make it mathematically doable, you do some tricks. So you can demand, demand R zero still gives finite things. The way to do that would be defining a few constants. So let's say that psi at r equals zero is psi zero, and this is finite. So I'm not doing anything fundamental, I am just saying that, yes, rho goes as r to the some negative power, but at r equals zero, it doesn't really follow that. It has some finite size here.
and then you can write down some psi prime that is psi over psi zero. And then you also define something else that looks like R over B, where B is defined as four-third pi G So this is something that is of length dimension. And you can get this by differentiating this equation. So here you are essentially looking at how exactly the rho is changing at very low r. And the form is not important for our purposes now, but I just wrote it down the, in details because it has a very interesting uh, property in real astrophysical systems. It, it's very important scale length. So if you do these coordinate transformations, then you can write down the Poisson's equation as So this is related to the distribution function, and since the distribution function is related to E, this is how I can write this. So at psi prime zero, this is one, and D e psi prime ds at zero, this is zero. since there is not, nothing really at the center. So there is, so as you keep decreasing the volume, the mass contained keeps decreasing because the density is finite at r equals zero. So that was not true if I hadn't gone to the new coordinate system and demanded that potential is finite at r equals zero. Because you can always have a infinitesimally small volume, but if there is a singularity, then it's not zero. Right? But because I demanded that it's not a singularity, then I can write this down. And this is actually a very famous equation. It's called len Emden equation. And from len Emden equation, you can get families of different types of distribution functions. So this equation actually has no analytical solution for general n. But there are two particular cases where it is analytically solvable. That's for n equals 1 and n equals 5. This one is a wave equation, Helmholtz wave equation. 
We're not going to worry about that here. And this one is, leads to a plumber sphere. So Plummer defined some um, density distribution, mass enclosed, and potential distribution based on the observed properties of galaxies. And it turns out that in the len emden equation for n equals 5, that's what leads to that kind of a distribution. So, if n equals 5, we can write down 1 over a square dds a square n equal to 0 cannot happen because of this. Oh, hang on. Uh, n equal to 0 also has an analytical solution. That's the isothermal sphere. Yeah, sorry. Isothermal. Uh, is it? So by analytical solution, I mean you can solve for x and v. Um, it's solvable. Okay. Sorry? Um, because um, the, so this is, Size is continuous. Yes. It is continuous. It is not smooth. It may not be smooth, but it's continuous. It's defined at all points. Attack. So, so this is, this is all I have done. So let's say, this is the shape where it's going all the way to infinity. All I said is that it doesn't go to infinity. It reaches this value. So it will get somewhere there. That's all I have done. So if this is the actual thing that should have happened, all I have said that it doesn't blow up, it reaches some finite value. And if you look at what this really is, this really is something related to the force, right? This is divergence of field. So force can only come from mass enclosed, so if you have a zero volume, then since it can never go infinite, in a zero volume, it will always be zero mass. So there will be no force. So the divergence will be zero. Does that make sense? And you can show yourself that, so I'm not solving the whole thing because you can, it's actually not that hard, but can be a bit painful. You can show yourself that this will be a solution.
I haven't, so you, you understand how to solve this, right? So you solve for, uh, so it can go either way. If you want to solve for psi prime, you solve this equation. If you want to solve for rho, then you just replace psi by rho using this equation. And then you solve the differential equation. And then you replace S with R and psi prime with psi. And you can get what the, potent, uh, the, the field is, the density distribution. That's the total energy. And that's del square phi. So. Uh, this should be negative. So the reason why I, I wrote down this quantity B is it turns out that roughly about at R equals B, the density drops to half of the central density. And observationally, that used to be what uh, observers called a core radius of a cluster or a galaxy. So, in this formalism, this B thing is something like a core radius, and Plummer spheres typically looks like this. And this goes on to infinity. So this is, so the mass is finite, but the extent is not finite. Oftentimes, when uh, people do star cluster modeling, Plummer sphere is a good approximation for initial conditions for uh, the X and V assignment of the stars, if it is not tidally truncated. So typically, stars are in some galaxy, right? And the galaxy will have some tidal force acting on the cluster. So in principle, a cluster cannot be infinitely large because the galaxy truncates it at some large distance. But if you, if you can ignore the tidal field, if you can uh, if you have a system where the tidal field is not important, then you can use reasonably accurately a Plummer model. And then since the density is going down uh, infinitesimally at large enough distances, uh, you can, it, it will be a okay initial condition. Um, Essentially, what a tidal field does is it erases a bunch of this because it cannot be bound to the cluster anymore, and you get a truncation radius. And to get a distribution function that can give very accurately a tidally truncated galaxy or a tidally truncated cluster, we need to do some more uh, need to look at uh, some more types of distribution functions. Okay. So everything is clear so far? Yeah. So if you want to remember something, in polytropic stellar dynamics models, n equals 5 is what is called a Plummer sphere, and that is a reasonable uh, approximation for uh, the phase space dense distribution function uh, in a non-tidally truncated clusters or galaxies. Even for dark matter, hello. Uh, yes, so a lot of uh, people actually use Plummer sphere to uh, model how 
stars will move in the halo of the dark matter. But uh, at uh, very large separations, uh, it's probably better to use NFW. So these, so these are all families of solutions, right? And ultimately, what solution you want to take depends on what you observe. So this is all nice and good. These are all valid solutions. But what exists in the, in the universe is what you should uh, adapt and use. So I guess by now, it's getting a little clearer why I was spending so much time with distribution functions. Like what, what the hell is distribution function and why that is useful, right? Okay, so now we are going to look at this n goes to infinity type model, so isothermal models. So before going into the math, let's um, discuss the idea of what it means really to have a isothermal stellar dynamical model. So it means that all these stars have interacted with, with themselves sufficiently already. And isothermal means there is some temperature equilibrium between the species, right? So that's the fundamental assumption in, in an isothermal model. But <clears throat> mathematically, it's very simple to show. And uh, let's, let's just do that. Uh, I will keep this condition and this assumption. So the easiest way to go to an isothermal model is, of course, going from the gas side, because that's easier to write, thing, write down. So this is isothermal. And if you take the hydrostatic equilibrium condition, you can write down dpdr equals So this is just from that equation. And then this equal to that is the hydrostatic equilibrium condition. And d phi dr is essentially gm over r square. So that means r square over rho d rho dr Minus GM over GPT.
Let's keep this. And then let's look at how oh, we have, uh, I have used this thing. I've used this identity. Now let's take a distribution function that looks like this. Then if you integrate over all V, you can show that You probably recognize this as something like a Maxwellian distribution. So E is defined to be minus energy. So usually it will be minus half V square minus I. So if you integrate over all V, you kind of know the, how the normalization works. You can show that rho. So this thing is defined as rho, right? So you are taking the distribution function, integrating over the velocity space. So you are getting a distribution of mass per spatial volume. So if this is true, then you can write down the Poisson's equation. So combining this one and that one,
If you replace psi with rho and do this, um, do some algebra, you can get ddr times r square d log rho dr equals minus 4 pi g This is just replacing psi with rho using this equation. So these two are equivalent equations, right? This and this one and this one. If you just compare the two, these uh, become exact if sigma square is this. So this is actually very interesting uh, in stellar dynamical systems because for an isothermal stellar dynamical sphere, uh, you can show, so this is what this is telling you, is the, there, there exists some quantity that you can see is related to the energy of the system, right? That is related to a thermodynamical system of KBT over M, so the energy here is equivalent to this. So oftentimes you will see that uh, in papers or books, um, people talk about uh, KT binaries, 1 KT binary, 10 KT binary. So that essentially means is that, so there they think about this kind of equivalence. So the energy of of a 1 kT binary would be equal to uh, this 1 kT. So that, what that means is whatever the neighborhood uh, random motion of other stars is, the velocity dispersion there is equal to the orbital energy of that binary. Uh, it's right. Um, okay, let me step back a little bit. So what this is telling you is that given a velocity dispersion using an equation like this, you can talk about some equivalent temperature of the system. So if you can talk about an equi uh, equivalent temperature, then in terms of the temperature, so if you, if you tell what the temperature is, you know what the velocity dispersion is. Now, if you know what the velocity dispersion is, you know statistically which binaries will be broken and which binaries will not be broken in any given system. So that's, uh, that was um, kind of the goal of the tutorial uh, sessions. So if you remember, you were looking at something, some figure like this, and this is the branching ratio. And if you have done this, it kind of looks like this. This is roughly one. So above this, so Vc is defined as the velocity uh, where the total energy is zero. So that means the 
typical interaction velocities will be of order 1 kT. And above that, you get more and more breaking of the binary. And below that, you typically have exchanges or preservation. So that becomes important because um, in a star cluster or galaxy, you cannot have arbitrarily uh, large same major axis of binaries. And what is the maximum same major axis you can have depends on the velocity dispersion. There is another point to note, and that you probably could have guessed without doing any of this. So the velocity dispersion also depends on the mass of the species. So if you have a mixture of different masses, then under the condition of isothermal uh, case, where the energies have been distributed, the velocity dispersion for high mass stars will be lower compared to the low mass stars by the ratio of the masses. And this leads to really interesting uh, situations for relaxed systems. So remember, all of this happen, all of this is happening. So this is, we are, we are following the collisionless Boltzmann equation. So all of this is happening where uh, the time scale that you are thinking about is small compared to the relaxation time scale. So this is still talking about um, how you start a system. Okay. And the distribution function uh, for any star uh, is conserved over time for these kind of time scales. But in relaxed systems, you can change the distribution functions and uh, you can change velocities of different species over several relaxation time scales. So you can have the heavy stars significantly slowing down in principle but as they slow down, they sink into the potential. And in the first Blackboard lecture, we showed that uh, as they sink into the potential, they lose kinetic energy, but lose potential energy more. As a result, they speed up. So now, this, is, this becomes a runaway system, runaway effect. So the more energy it gives, the higher the speed becomes, higher the velocity dispersion becomes, and the more it can give energy. And they keep on sinking. Um, right. So this is for the isothermal sphere we were doing. So let's um, look at the solution. So that's the equation we're solving.
we were trying to solve for rho in an isothermal sphere. And since I know the form of the solution, I just said this. This is actually the same thing as this family of solutions. And this is what you get. So from this, you know that this must be zero. Because on this side, it doesn't depend on R. So B equals two. So if you plug in B equals two, then you can write C equals sigma square over two pi G. So your rho Oh, sorry, yes, I forgot that. So that's row. Again, you see the same problem. Rho at zero is infinite. Right. So let's write down some of the things. R over G. Circular velocity at R is. These are the general solutions. The problems again is at R, there is a singularity. And the field does not die down rapidly. So there are several different types of solutions. So, I mean, for example, the singularity you can very easily avoid by doing the same kind of exercise. You just defined, define some values at r equals zero. Um, that just renormalizes the uh, central values. But at r equals infinity, you still have uh, some field. That can be, um, so to make that reasonable, uh, you can uh, do some modifications to your distribution function. Where did it go? Ah, there. You can make some modifications of the isothermal distribution function. And if you do that modification, it becomes something very powerful, and everyone uses that profile for their initial cluster conditions or galaxy. Uh, phase space. So let's do that. Is this? Let me write down something. 
n equals infinity is isothermal n equals 5 is plumber so that was isothermal and there is this family of distribution functions that are called lowered isothermal. So the idea essentially is you make some renormalization as we did for the plumber sphere to make the, the singularity go away at r equals zero. And you multiply this distribution function with some truncation. So you can write it down as So it's exactly this, except for this additional term. This makes at large r it to become finite. Okay. Sometimes this is um, also called the truncation of an isothermal uh, sphere. And this was first proposed by Ivan King a long time ago. And a family of curves that you can get, a family of solutions that you can get from this kind of distribution function are called King models. And King models are uh, practically everywhere. Um, so whenever you take an N uh, self-gravitating stellar system, uh, almost always you start with a king model of some kind. So let's look at the form of the king model. So this is not analytically solvable, okay? So the density looks somewhat like this. It's kind of so let's call it king density. So, f is error function. And we can write down the Poisson's equation. Mm, hang on, do I need to write down the Poisson's equation? Yes, I do.
So that's essentially what the Poisson's equation looks like. But let's um, demand some things. So we can choose to have boundary conditions so that we don't have infinities at the center. So we can say that at r, r equals 0, p psi dr is 0. So if you demand that the density does not blow up at center, then that's what you get. It's the same, same thing before. And this is essentially the second derivative of psi, right? And you can see that for very small r, uh, for finite psi, the second derivative becomes negative. So to think of the behavior of a King profile, so since this is not analytically solvable, I'm just talking about some interesting behavior. So let's try to draw this, draw a density profile. This is some function of R. Actually, this is R over R0. This is the king radius. So this comes from renormalizing the central singularity. So at the center, it has some finite value. Let's call it psi at 0. And then we know that at very large r, we have truncated it. So let's call it some truncation radius rt. And now what's the shape in between? So the shape in between is something like a plumber's, uh, sorry, isothermal sphere for low r, because that's what we have used here. And for large radius, it kind of truncates faster than isothermal. So actually, the shape kind of looks like this. And there can be many different curves that kind of look like that. And the way you define a particular King model from this family is really dependent on these two parameters. So people define some concentration parameter as log 10 of RT over R0. And some central potential, phi naught, that is something like psi zero. These are the only two parameters that you need to set, and that gives a uniform, uh, unique density distribution, velocity dispersion, etc. Um, so this is often called the concentration parameter. So you can say that I want a king model of concentration parameter some value. Equivalently, you could set something that is a function of the central potential. And oftentimes, people use this quantity W0. And you can say, I want a king model with W0 of some value. Um, I believe. W0 equals 4 gives almost, um, is almost equivalent to Plummer sphere. But of course, Plummer sphere will not end. It will not go to zero, the density. 
So these, uh, these plumber spheres, isothermal spheres, and king profiles are uh, some of the most used distribution functions and density profiles that we observe in the universe. So it turns out that if you plot um, globular clusters, uh, um, densities, then they are somewhere between uh, four and eight-ish, typically. Um, and depending on how dynamically evolved a globular cluster is, concentration increases. And the way it works is if you increase phi zero, as a result, it becomes more expanded. So you go up, and it takes longer to die down. And if you increase C, then it becomes more like that. So the density near the center becomes higher compared to uh, in the out outskirts. And typically, globular clusters go from a lower C to a higher C as they evolve. There are exceptions in particular situations. Uh, the exceptions come from when um, the evolution of the uh, distribution function or the density is not dominated by two-body relaxation. So for example, you have so very early in a cluster or a galaxy's uh, formation, um, all the high mass stars are losing mass a lot and they are going supernova all at a time. So all of these um, ejected mass, they typically have ejection velocities much higher than the cluster escape speed. So in, and this is happening at a much shorter time scale than the relaxation time scale. So the evolution of the profile becomes governed by the mass loss from the center rather than uh, having a roughly constant mass and it's just evolving under gravity. Okay. So since I talked about escape, let's do one quick estimation. Actually, let me skip that. This can be your tutorial problem. So, so far, okay. Um, so, anyone have any questions on this? Up to here? Okay. So let's uh, very quickly go to something that is extremely important in globular clusters. And so remember, the globular clusters are collisional systems. So these systems are relaxed. So how do you change the equations that govern the, your distribution function uh, for a system where um, the phase space is not conserved? Right? That's what collisional systems are. So remember collisionless systems where df dt equals zero. In collisional systems, you cannot use zero. Let's call it some gamma. That's a source term. Let's say that psi at some phase space uh, position or and velocity. with some delta W volume
at some delta t, so, okay, sorry, let me phrase this correctly. So say probability that a star with phase space w is scattered to a volume of d6w around w at delta t is this. So a star that wasn't in this volume before, but got scattered into that volume in time delta t. So that's how this is defined. So let's think about how to write this source term. So this is the amount of star that's leaving that volume. And this is what's entering that volume. So this happens when a star, because of phase space diffusion, was in a volume before, but leaves that volume. And this is happening because some other star scatters a star into this volume because of phase space diffusion. It was in a different volume before, but now it got scattered into that volume. So your df dt gamma is del f del t plus plus del f del t minus. This is a somewhat scary looking thing and uh, hopefully I haven't made any notation mistakes. But you have seen expressions like this all, all the time, right? So this is essentially where um, how you should write uh, things just before Taylor expansion. So you, you can solve it at one position and then you want to know how it's going to, how, how its value is going to change in a different position, and then you can write down an expansion. So this is exactly the same thing, okay? And in fact, 
that's how collisional uh, Boltzmann equations are solved for distribution functions. So there are a few uh, interesting things uh, to remember. Uh, remember uh, the scattering uh, experiment that I showed where uh, the velocity change was like this, where this is the impact parameter and that is the impact parameter that will create a 90 degree deflection. So, if you think of a real system, this is typically very small compared to what a typical B is, okay? So that means this is typically small compared to this, okay? So that means that this delta W will be small compared to W. So you can make an expansion in delta W over W. Um, then there is another thing that significantly simplifies that equation. That is the time of interaction is typically much smaller than the crossing time. So, the crossing time is, yes? Yes, yeah, so it is continuous. It's, it can happen. All. all of that is happening in delta T. We can talk about that later. So let, let me uh, tell you how to make this simple, okay? Um, so if you assume that, then what that really means is typically during the interaction, the positions are not changing. Position of the star in the smooth potential. So remember everything is kind of, there is a underlying orbit in the smooth potential, and all of that mechanism is how that orbit is changing over time. So, since crossing time is roughly the time scale for that smooth potential orbit, and since deflections are happening very fast, so only when they come close to each other, You can write this down, and then during the deflection, you can say that it's essentially static in the smooth orbit. What that means is that, okay, so what this means is that delta W is, so can expand. And what this means is delta W equal to delta X, delta V, and delta X is zero. So delta W comes only during interaction, and during interaction, delta X is roughly zero because in the smooth potential, it's not moving. So you can take this equation, expand it in delta W up to the second order, because the first order is just the mean, mean change in velocity, and that can have any uh, sign 
So in principle, it can be zero. So the second order that depends on terms like delta W squares and delta WI, delta WJ, these terms definitely will not be zero. So up to that order you need to take into account. And you can replace them with these and make all delta x dependent terms zero. So this is the so-called Fokker-Planck approximation. And um, there are uh, several codes that um, solve the Fokker-Planck uh, equation um, numerically to get how um, a star cluster will evolve over time. Okay? So all you are calculating is through these uh, interactions how a phase space of a particular star is diffusing and changing. Okay? There are two particular um, families of codes. Um, one is called orbit following and another is called or orbit averaged. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, there is a third point that I forgot to mention. So if you think about it, um, you can always find a delta T that is much less than relaxation time and much higher than an interaction time. Why? Because remember the relaxation time was defined to be a time when delta v is equal uh, delta v square was equal to v square and each interaction um, uh, created very small delta v square so you needed of order n interactions to uh, have these things relaxed so you can always choose a time interval within which a large number of interactions have happened but which is a small fraction of the relaxation time. So what that tells you is, and let's call it delta T1, T cross T2, So some interaction time and some other time that is greater than interaction time, which is smaller than the crossing time, and then some other time that is greater than the crossing time, but smaller than the relaxation time. That's possible at large n because T cross and T relax are related by of order n, and interactions are much, interaction times are smaller, okay? So that means you can have orbit in one, one orbit if something has an interaction that created a significant delta V, then in that orbit there is a very low probability to have another such interaction. So you can uh, consider each interaction independent of each other because by the time it has another interaction, weak interaction from large distances will significantly make its phase space get diffused. So, does it make sense? So each interaction, each def deflection you can take as independent of each other. So what that allows you to do is um, you can Choose a time that satisfies these conditions. So let's take this time. And you can say that within this time, large number of these delta Vs happened. 
So from, and each of these delta v's are independent of each other. So from central limit theorem, this delta v's must be a Gaussian. So all you care about is the mean of these delta v's and the dispersion of the delta v's. And they are essentially going to be related to the diffusion coefficient that you can get from here. So by diffusion coefficients, I mean uh, quantities like this. If you have these delta v's are all independent and you are only interested in time intervals that are long compared to the interaction time scales, then this problem becomes extremely simple. You can take some Gaussian of delta v's. You can calculate that depending on the current distribution function at any given position. And you can derive these delta v, delta vj quantities just from what you expect here. And this allows you to take time steps that are much larger to the crossing time or the dynamical time or the interaction time. So in typical uh, codes uh, that can do globular clusters, uh, globular cluster like ends, um, for n large, uh, what this basically tells you is you don't really need to calculate the pairwise forces. So if you want to calculate the pairwise forces, the com computational complexity is n square per time step. And then to evolve it for at least one relaxation time, you get another n because your time steps are some fraction of the crossing time and the relaxation time is proportional to n times the crossing time. So it's, uh, if you do a direct n body calculation, the computational complexity goes as n cubed. But if you do one of these approximate uh, calculations, um, these are called Monte Carlo. And there are two different families of Monte Carlo. So the one particularly I'm talking about is Hinon. He first proposed this type of Monte Carlo. So all you need to do here is you have some distribution of stars, let's say some king profile that you have chosen. So initially you start with the mass of the star and its positions and velocities. And then you take a time step that is some small fraction of the relaxation time. And you say that during this relaxation time, the phase space of that star given by the angular momentum and energy of that star will change because of large number of independent uh, delta v's and you sample from this one of these delta v's and no not sample you take a cumulative effect of this so the cumulative effect would essentially be for first power of delta v it will be the mean of delta v and the second power would be the dispersion so you calculate these quantities for that star at that location and then you change the energy and angular momentum of that star and then you recalculate the orbit with the new energy and angular momentum and you do this for all n stars and it turns out that the computational complexity there is of order n and this comes from sorting. So at any point of time, you need to know what the Hamiltonian is for that particular star. So you need to know what is mass enclosed. So typically what we do is we start with a 
description of stars. And then we sort them radially. We say that these stars, and then calculate the, the orbit of each star, and do this Monte Carlo approximation because, these, because of these three conditions. And then we have new energy and angular momentum, solve for new orbits, and then sort them again, and if keep doing that. So the power of this method is at any point, you start with a discrete description of the star cluster. So instead of having a smooth potential, you actually have stars that have masses and radii and uh, velocities. And then you assume that all of these holds, and then you do the relaxation step. And after you have calculated the new position, uh, new orbits, you randomly sample a position and velocity on that orbit for that star. And then again, you get back mass and positions and velocities. So after every step, you have the full end body picture. So you can put, put in uh, all kinds of uh, physics that do not happen over a relaxation time scale. So we can pick it up from here in the next, next talk. If you have any questions, it's kind of late. Uh, maybe we can address it in the tutorial. <laughs>